Excellency, distinguished guests, Secretary General, and distinguished guests, professors from the academic community in Thailand, uh, welcome this morning. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to stand here and address you um, on the topic of international, internationalization of higher education policy and strategy. I've been in Thailand for one month at this point, and uh, it's been one of the more interesting uh, and rewarding professional experiences of my career thus far. I've met a lot of very interesting people from the academic community here and the support services of the academic community. And it's a, a pleasure to see uh, some of you in the room today, friendly faces um, and people I've learned a lot from um, over the past month. This morning, I'd like to go through uh, the findings uh, of, of my research uh, and learning over the past month. And this is going to focus chiefly on the areas of comparison and learning between the Bologna process in Europe and the increasing movement towards integration and harmonization of higher education structures in the ASEAN region, in the ASEAN community, leading up to 2015 and indeed beyond 2015. So the overall objective of my assignment while in Thailand was to enhance bilateral strategy dialogues, raise awareness of Thai higher education institutions of their important role in higher education integration uh, and regional integration of higher education, and conduct an assessment of the existing, some of the existing higher education programs, chiefly the AIMS program uh, and the effect that that has had on the internationalization of high higher education and collaboration within the region, the ASEAN region as a whole. So I'd like to start this morning by looking at the, the Bologna process, very briefly looking at its main historic moments, the current drivers and the future momentum of the process as it leads into Horizon 2020 and Erasmus Plus. Excuse me, Erasmus Plus. And you'll see that I've included a quote here from John Monet, or John Monet, if you prefer. And we share so many commonalities in regions, and if we only work together, we will see that there are far fewer differences and many more <coughs> So, you will all be familiar with the Bologna process, uh, how it has worked through uh, its, its various phases, uh, and really been supported by the various structures uh, which have been established over time to deal with the expansion uh, of it and, and the need to support uh, capacity. It was launched in 2010, but the work has not stopped. And we continue to add to the process with regular meetings uh, and regular uh, delegations uh, and, and communiques uh, from uh, the, the various working groups and the secretariat. So it originated in the Sorbonne Dec Declaration in 1998 and led through various declarations, communiques and ministerial meetings right through until the most recent in Bucharest in 2012. And as you can see, year on year, declaration after declaration, the Bologna process has expanded and added more countries to its present number of 47 countries in the region. And really it all began with Erasmus. Is it Arias Erasmus of Rotterdam, as he's better known? He was the paragon of an international student. An international student perhaps before the concept of international students really existed. 
a man whose concept was that the best learning was learning in other contexts and learning from the rich experience of other countries. So the European Community Action Scheme for the Mobility of University Students was in some ways named after him. And it was established in 1987. Its focus, much like Erasmus' focus himself, was on provision of exceptional education opportunities and experiences through mobility. And in this sense, mobility is the driving force behind internationalization. All of the internationalization efforts that we undertake are supporting mobility and facilitation of students to move across borders and to have new knowledge and new experience as a result. And the primacy of this mobility was acknowledged at the Berlin Ministerial Summit in 2003, and it continues to be an integral part of the European Integration Harmonization Mission. So, some of the historic moments of the impetus created by Erasmus and the need to support higher education and international higher education. Many of these concepts will already be very familiar with you, to you, not only in the European context, but in your own context, as many of these initiatives have also been taken in the ASEAN region in the last while. So, some of the current drivers of the Bologna process. Increasingly, with some economic difficulties, we're focused on preparing students for knowledge economies, preparing students for the workplace, lifelong learning, student-centered learning, and employability. We're imparting to students that their learning never ends, that they will be expected to adapt to new situations and apply new knowledge as they move through their career. Another important facet is that of balanced mobility. It's no longer tenable for one country to attract the most inbound students without participating in sending outbound students. The attendant costs and benefits of mobility must be shared. Innovative funding sources are in sharp focus. As government budgets become stretched, it is really up to the universities to find new and innovative ways to support their activities. That is not to say that they won't be supported by their governments and by the, the regional uh, institutions, but it is a very important aspect of collaborative research and strategic partnership that funding uh, is a part of. Increasingly, we realize, that we, we realize that we don't live in isolation and that the problems of the world, no matter how far away they are, can affect us and can have ramifications for our security. So our responsibility is to provide access to higher education for all and engage with emerging and developing markets. The Mobility for Better Learning strategy was adopted and has a timeline of 2020 to ensure that 20% of all graduating students in the European area, the European Union, will have had a mobility experience. The European higher education area in a global setting recognizes recognizes its potential to engage further with the global community through education and chiefly higher education. The Bologna process is far from complete and with 47 countries there is an increasing need for all structures to be implemented as is appropriate 
to those countries and to their companies. Quality assurance and quality itself goes to the heart of everything we do in education. We do need these assurances and we do need structures to ensure that these assurances and these conditions are being met. Future momentum. Bologna continues at pace, and it continues at pace through Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020. Europe continues to be a very attractive destination and has quite a large share of the international student, the, the mobile international student population. But this isn't a certainty, isn't always a certainty. And in order to remain relevant, Europe needs to drive innovation in its learning environments and constantly provide new and formative ways for international students to access not just higher education, but the global economy as well. There needs to be more transparency. And it is a, a stated aim for the institutions participating in the processes that they are transparent on their programs, application procedures, and overall support structures within their institutions. There's increasingly a desire for institutions and countries at large to take control of what their strategy represents, what their strategy should be, and how that is relevant to them. The Erasmus Plus program, leading to 2020, is projected to benefit 34,000 students on EU funding from our program. There is an increasing focus on international cooperation with emerging and developing regions of the world, and this is seen as a major facet of the social responsibility agenda. We need to find new ways of delivering mobility. Mobility isn't just about getting on a plane and visiting a new country. Mobility can be experienced at home, and we can internationalize our campuses through the use of online communication technology or information communication technology. Mobility then has always been the driving force behind Bologna and therefore Bologna has supported mobility. Three million people have experienced the Erasmus program over its 25 year history. This is a stellar figure to, to reflect on. If we think of the multiplier effect of three million people who have had a good international experience and the, the ripple effect of that call, it's hard to, to underestimate. Comprehensive quality and academic structures have allowed for increasing confidence in the university sector and in national education sectors to be more ambitious in developing partnerships, not just within their own communities, not just within the European community, but internationally in the wider world. Since 2004 and the, the genesis of Erasmus Mundus, there have been many new and innovative joint master's programs developed, 43 joint doctoral programs with just under 700 higher education institutions, 16,000 students, doctoral candidates, and scholars. So as stated, the ripple effect, the knock-on effect, the multiplier effect, and the tangible and intangible benefits of international mobility cannot be underestimated and need to be seen as a core strategy in every nation and government's direction maximizing its international reputation. I'd like to now turn my attention to the ASEAN higher education area and the potential for development. Um, those of 
overview from King Mongkut's University of, uh, of Technology in Tongari will be pleased to see that I'm referencing you on, on this occasion. So the critical development and the critical staging posts of mobility in driving ASEAN integration are outlined here. It begins with the student. The student is at the center of learning. Faculty, researchers, all realize that mobility is a win-win. It's good for all concerned. This will then lead further into ASEAN integration through the implementation of programs such as the AIMS program and the many other programs that have been run in the region over the last decades. ASEAN integration undoubtedly leads to international competitiveness and international profile. Forgive me the slides. So if we look back then at the key learning from Bologna in the context of ASEAN, we have said that mobility has always been much more to the Bologna process than merely just an action line. It is central to the process. The starting point for all internationalization initiatives is developing a critical mass, a demand in the student population, in the academic community, to be mobile, to have international experience, not just abroad, but also on campus. The massification of education has much to do with it. And as the demand for education grows, along with that, the demand for mobility and international experience will grow. It would be a mistake to take the view that we can transplant the Bologna process in the ASEAN region. That would be short-sighted and would neglect the importance of the development context and the, the international knowledge that is already within this, this region. So ASEAN has its own process to follow. It has its own path to take. And that it is well on the way to do it. ASEAN can be bigger than Belong. In 25 years, we may not be talking about just 3 million students or just 4 million students benefiting from a particular initiative. It may be considerably more. The adequate structures will need to be in place in order for this scaling up to happen. And it has to be done sustainably with the recognition that the student experience is critical. The student is at the center of all initiatives and all development. In Europe, we often discuss autonomy, and certainly in academic institutions, we discuss autonomy as almost the holy grail. But autonomy and self-determination need to be drivers for innovation. And they can be supported by larger, more collective initiatives. So the idea is that if we bring our own personal contacts, our own reflections, on what makes us an excellent provider. And we share this collectively, we can be empowered to develop all the more. In one of my meetings with Dr. Superchai at Chula Longhorn University, he gave me a very interesting analogy. He compared Europe to an orchestra which is, in many ways, led from the center with individuals of, uh, and individual participants uh, of, of great ability. And he compared ASEAN to a jazz band, where the participants 
in the education endeavor, the integration and harmonization endeavor, are somewhat more self-directed and somewhat more autonomous. Now, I don't know about you, but I like classical music. I also like jazz music. And I think both can sound just as good as one another when they're done well. And I think we can clearly see that both systems, both approaches are doing very well. So, to reflect for a moment then on aims, the ASEAN Mobility uh, Program for uh, ASEAN students. It has been, it has come through a, a number of different iterations. It was formerly the Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand program. It has been renamed. And there's been consistent development and great plans for the future. I was lucky enough to be able to visit many universities over the last month. And I visited all of the, the institutions that are currently participating in the AIMS program. And we conducted a series of discussions, open interviews, semi-structured interviews. We also received uh, insights from the students who participated on this program either as inbound or outbound students. And the overwhelming sense we have is that the AIMS program is a very positive force in mobility in Thailand and throughout the region. The happiness, the sense of contentment, the sense of achievement that the students reflected on could only recommend the expansion of this program and the further development of the further expansion of the programs and the countries that participate in. It seemed to be meeting its stated objectives, and in some cases, perhaps meeting more than its stated objectives. It should be expanded, but it should be expanded in a sustainable way in a way that keeps ASEAN to the core. It was a program established for the ASEAN region. It should remain a program for the ASEAN region. But that's not to say that it cannot have interaction and collaboration with the dialogue partners in the region, ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus six, and perhaps ASEAN the world. Universities did express a, a doubt or a slight concern uh, about certain countries um, and their desire to actively participate in the program. Um, this is being addressed, and it's being addressed at uh, institutional and, and governmental level. And the universities are very aware of the potential for the AIMS program in driving integration and harmonization, the opportunities presented by ASEAN, the ASEAN community. There were some discussions about funding uh, and funding sources, hampering the ability to make that long-term commitment. But it is clear that there is a commitment to the provision of the program, to the expansion of the program, and this will be uh, a concern or an uncertainty that is resolved in the two courts. On a few occasions, we heard comments such as evaluation fatigue, where institutions were a little bit concerned that they had so many forms, so many evaluation forms, uh, so many evaluation reports to fill out. And I'm afraid I contributed 
to the workload here uh, as well uh, in, in sending in uh, some late questionnaires. But uh, I do thank you all for your responses. It's been instrumental in informing the research. And here is an example of uh, some of these areas. So the universities reflected on some of the expected outcomes of the AIMS program. Promoting multilateral and consortia agreements, enhancing academic cooperation with other countries, and enhancing balanced mobility with other countries. And I think as is very clear from the graph, uh, the overall level of satisfaction in these areas is quite high. I should note that these were based on responses from um, international relations officers and other senior staff in the international in the universities international international departments. On the question of credit transfer and qualification recognition, the universities were also confident that the international credit transfer scheme was being well promoted and the mutual recognition of qualification was continuing at pace. The universities also reflected on their, their own ability uh, and the, the host university's ability to provide preparatory support prior to departure for uh, outbound students. For the host universities uh, and counterpart universities' ability to select students to participate in the program. And coordination with host universities was also deemed to be quite high in the main. Somewhat uh, questionable uh, graph here, um, whether students were students' competencies were enhanced uh, for the global society. Uh, it seemed to be something of a, a mixed bag. But with a research sample of this size, and uh, a somewhat funky uh, approach to uh, gathering research over a very short period. It's difficult to draw too many defining conclusions uh, which wouldn't benefit from further study. So let's reassess what is this piece the strange piece that we call internationalization in higher education. It's something that means many things to many different people, but can also mean different things to different people. And if we could reflect on the poem of The Six Blind Men of Hindustan by John Godfrey Sachs. Shall I read it? It was six men, six blind men of Hindustan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant and happened to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to fall. God bless me, but the elephant is very much like a wall. The second, feeling of the tusk, cried, Oh, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp, to me his mighty clear. This wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal, and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very much like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. It is clear enough the elephant, the elephant is very like the fruit. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said, Even the blindest man can tell what this resembles most, deny the fact he can, this marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth, no sooner had begun, about the beast to grow, than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within its scope. I see, quote he, the elephant is very much like a rope. And so these men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly right. 
and all were in the wrong. Partly in the right. And partly right also. We all have a concept of what internationalization is. And that concept is very much grounded in our own context, in the context of what it presents to us, how we interact with it, how we can deal with it, how we experience it day to day. But we would all benefit from wider reflection, wider learning, and the opportunity to share best practice and concepts of internationalization with others. And this forms, in large part, the basis of my recommendations for internationalization policy and strategy in higher education. The community of practice that exists in Thailand, in Thai higher education, is strong. You are familiar with each other as a group of people, you're familiar with your institutions and other institutions. You're aware of what opportunities other institutions have that you may not have, and what opportunities you have that others may not have. But the collective opportunity you have is to share a passion, a passion for something that you feel is valuable, not just to your institution, but also to your society, to your country at large, and to your region at large. So communities of practice are groups whose members share a passion for something they know how to do, and who interact regularly to learn how to do it better. So universities, if they gather together in communities of practice, can identify diverse, cohesive working groups to better evaluate and better implement internationalization strategy and approaches to internationalization. It's an opportunity to conceptualize, share ideas, find solutions, discuss problems, aggregate new knowledge, contextualize new knowledge, combine new knowledge for the betterment of not just our institutions, but the wider community of practice in high higher education, and indeed, the community of practice in ASEAN education. So what of evaluation critique? Well, the idea that we can all be adequately measured by one standardized test is fast losing ground. Although simplicity and economy dictates that we would apply the same empirical measures to institutions. It is the same measure as the ranking system used. And I think it's, there are different opinions about the value of ranking systems and assessments in the room. So what is proposed is that the universities begin to take control of evaluation themselves that their evaluation becomes self-directed, grounded in their own context, grounded in what they see as having the most potential and the niche that they bring to the higher education community. This is best facilitated through action research. Action research is inherently the education. It is also highly theoretical and can trace its beginnings from Aristotle, Jürgen Habermas, Paulo Freire, all giants in the theory of, of education. But while it is theoretical, it is also grounded in practice. It is grounded in the day-to-day -day practicalities that we face and that we experience in our own context. 
and therefore, as a form of research, it's committed to action. It's committed to solving problems, providing solutions, and raising capacity, implementing improvement in all areas. So an action research model can be taken as a very straightforward cycle of iterative improvement to identifying a problem, planning an intervention, implementing that intervention, evaluating the outcome, reflecting on that outcome, and through the critical theory and the nature of reflection understanding what is the benefit, what is the outcome, how do we move from here, where do we go from here. It's a gradual process, it's cyclical, it allows participants to reflect over time and identify ways of improving their practice. Largely because it takes a long time, it's also very rigorous and valid in the context of the situation which is applied. But it requires ownership and it requires champions. It requires a community of practice in order for it to su survive. And institutions, if they are going to implement such a strategy, such an approach, need to put in place the architecture, put in place the community of practice to allow this Moving on, another recommendation uh, I have was that universities leverage existing facilities and digital technology to establish cross-cultural learning, learning opportunities with partner institutions, international partner institutions. Between 2006 and 2010, I was able to conduct research at Waseda University in Tokyo. And my supervisor was a lady by the name of Nakano Michiko, or Michiko Nakano, with her first name first. She was one of the implementers, in fact, the originator of cross-cultural distance learning at Waseda University. And I had met some of her colleagues in, in visiting to the long farm and also Tamsak University. There is a need to provide international opportunities, internationalization opportunities for students who are not mobile, for students who do not have the opportunity to get on a plane and spend six months of their lives or a year of their lives or longer in other countries. This is a route to that. And with the most basic of technology, the right agreements, and the right will to make this succeed, this can be delivered in short order with great ease. Other recommendations. There is a great desire by the Bureau of International Cooperation Strategy at the Office of Higher Education Development. Office of Higher Education Commission, excuse me, to establish further regional and international ones. And this can be done through existing structures. The Bureau of International Cooperation Strategy wishes to support all of you in doing this. And it is its stated aim to develop the links between international communities the international community and the international education community. Thai higher education is growing in reputation. It's growing in recognition. So perhaps now is time for a national brand for Thai higher education to be established. This requires a website. It requires, again, a community of practice which is willing to sit down and determine a strategy of how best to project high higher education in an international context.
Here's to the future of Thai higher education and ASEAN higher education and the community. Thank you very much for your time and for your attention.